The Lord be with you. I hope you will join me in turning in your copy of Holy Scripture. Perhaps the words will be there on the wall shortly as we read together. Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord, descending from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, his clothing white as snow. For fear of him the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. For he has been raised, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, holy God, we pray for eyes to see, hearts open to receive, ears to hear your words, and not mine. And may your words, Lord, call us ever on to do what you would have us to do, so that we may be the people you call us to be. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. It was one early fall afternoon. Sally and I were taking a walk around the neighborhood where we lived. We lived in town then. When we turned the corner onto a narrow street and came upon an elderly woman who was apparently in some sort of distress. She was obviously delirious, sort of talking out of her head, flailing her arms a little wildly. Perhaps she had forgotten to take her medication that morning. And she was terribly distraught. I seem to remember her telling us that, that she had been locked out of her house and the men who had locked her out of her house had spray painted the windows so she couldn't see in. We weren't sure what she was talking about. I had my phone in my hand. I had dialed 911 and was waiting to push send in case we couldn't find where this woman lived, in case when we did arrive to her house, in fact, someone had broken in and instead of stealing the china and the jewelry, had spray painted the windows. But as it turned out, she wasn't far from her home at all. In fact, she was right in the front yard, right outside of her house. She lived in the last home in a row of neat brick townhouses. Each of them had a, a hip-high brick fence around their front lawns. And Sally and I walked with her through the little wrought iron gate in her front yard, down the short sidewalk and up to the front door. I had to ask her one more time, Ma'am, are you sure this is your house? Because I really didn't want to knock on the door and somebody look at me and go, Look, we don't want Girl Scout cookies and we already got a religion. So I asked her one more time, I rang the doorbell, I heard the noise inside, hurried footsteps, saw a figure in the privacy glass of the front door, and as I heard the deadbolt turn, the knob twist, the door opened, and wouldn't you know it, it was Harold. I knew Harold. Harold was a member of the church where I was a pastor. And as it turned out, this scared, confused woman was Harold's wife. 
Harold invited us into his home, took his wife by the hand. As we walked in, we walked up the couple of stairs up to their neat little sitting room. And he put his arm around me, and all he kept saying, he kept apologizing. I'm sorry she got out. I'm sorry. I'm sorry she usually doesn't do this. She's not always like this. She just has these sorts of spells. And after assuring Harold, it's okay. Don't, there's nothing to worry about. We're glad she's all right. Glad it was us who found her, not someone else. We sat there in their tidy living room and visited for a good little while. When it was time for us to go, Sally and I got up to leave. We thanked them, said thanks for letting us come in. It was good visiting with you. Told Harold's wife, it's nice to meet you. Harold showed us to the front door the whole time, apologizing. Saying things like, she hasn't always been like this. It didn't used to be like this. A few months later, I was standing next to Harold as we stood next to a hole in the ground. It was where we put his wife's body after she died. I had visited with the two of them a few times since that day we ran into her on the road. Her her health faded quickly, but Harold's wasn't too far behind. I went to see him a few days after her funeral. He was in the hospital. I remember telling him, Uh, that that it was so nice to have actually got to meet his wife. He was telling me about her, about the things they used to do together, how because they were unable to have children, they spent their time and their money on each other, how he spent most of his time helping others at the church, volunteering as a chaplain. And I remember, I remember Harold saying to me, while he was lying there in that hospital bed, he said, I just, I always hope, that things one day would just go back to normal, back to the way they used to be. I remember telling him words I would repeat a few days later at his funeral. I said, you know, when things like this happen, we can't really ever go back to normal. That the truth is, this is the new normal. But isn't it something? When life throws us a curveball, when things aren't the way we want them, we just want things to go back to the way they were. When things are tense, when things are strange, new, we just want things to go back to the way they used to be, back to normal. But things can't ever really go back, can they? I wonder... Perhaps those first followers of Jesus had hoped things would just go back to normal after everything ran off the rails on that Friday we now call good. I can hear them, can't you? After Jesus' crucifixion, after it's obvious to everyone that this whole Jesus movement is over, I can hear them. Peter and Andrew, the brothers, sitting around talking about how good it used to be. Peter might say something to Andrew like, don't don't you just miss it? Don't you wish we could just go back to Galilee, back to Dad's boat, push off, go out in the water, throw the nets over and haul in the fish? Don't you just miss it? When it was just us, back when we, we, we knew what we were doing, don't you miss it? You remember, you remember how the folks would wait for us on the shore when we'd come rowing in with all those fish, how excited they'd be when we got a good catch. Don't you wish, Andrew, we could just go back, back to before it all, this stuff started, back when we knew what we were doing, when the world made sense, when we had it all figured out, when we didn't have to be afraid of anything except flipping the boat over on the way out. Don't you just wish? I can hear them. I can hear them just wanting things to go back, back to normal. But things can't ever really go back, can they? I like to think of Levi, Jesus' disciple, the tax collector, thumbing through his contacts. Where's, where did I put the number of the tax assessor's office? Maybe I can get my old job back. Yeah, I still got all those. I was pretty good about shaking folks down for taxes. Maybe he just wishes he could pretend all this stuff never happened. Pick right up where he left off. Or maybe Simon the Zealot, that was one of Jesus' followers. I wonder, I wonder if he thought to himself, is it too late to go join the movement, to get back 
and get back into the protest, back into the, the planned ways of, of, of standing up against the Roman oppressors. I can see him mulling over the possibilities, calling his old friends. Do you think it's too late? I'd like to go back. I'd like to get back in. Going over the scenarios in his head of ways he might be able to get back to normal. Things don't ever really go back to normal. Maybe normal was a bit different for some of the other disciples. Maybe Philip, Bartholomew, John calls him Nathaniel. I think he did him a favor there. But maybe Philip and Bartholomew, they just wanted things to go back, not all the way back, maybe just back to the way things were, you know, a week ago when Jesus was drawing a crowd. Riding in on a donkey, folks shouting, Hosanna, not crucify him. Can we just go back to that? Back to that. When Jesus was still a healer, a prophet, a wildly popular teacher, a worker of miracles. Maybe. Can we just go back? Maybe there were some disciples who wanted things to just go back to where Jesus was just an itinerant preacher, walking around out in the country, saying things like, you know, repent for the kingdom of God is, is near, just like his cousin. He said some radical things every once in a while, but he hadn't taken them to their ultimate conclusion. Can we just go back? Things could just go back there before they got out of hand. Back before Jesus got himself into trouble. Back before, back before the disciples themselves had to lay low in fear for their own lives. If things could just go back to safe reliable, dependable, normal. But things don't go back to normal, do they? Of course, for a few of Jesus' followers, the desire to go back to normal was about more than their own safety, more than a wish for steadier times. We Protestants sometimes tend to overlook the reality of Mary as one of Jesus' disciples. Mary, Jesus' own mother, was among his disciples. I can't imagine. Can't do it. I can't imagine what pain and terrible grief she must have felt on Friday. To watch her son be crucified, taken down and placed in the tomb. I can't imagine what she must have gone through in the night on Friday, waking up on Saturday all the way into the dim, dark hours of fr Sunday morning. I like to imagine that she left the tomb Friday night, made it home in time for Shabbat, time for supper. And in those waking hours, restless hours of the night, she got up, walked into the den, and turned on a lamp and pulled down the photo album, opened it up. There's Joseph, the man who stood beside her, when the angel told her the news, the man who said, I could divorce you and have every right to, the Bible says so, but he doesn't. There's Joseph, maybe a picture of little Jesus on Joseph's shoulders. He's been gone, been gone for a while now. Maybe as she turns in the page, a note falls out of the photo album. A little note, it had come on a gift. It says, enjoy the frankincense and myrrh. Don't, spill, don't, don't spend the gold all in one place. Signed, the Magi. Maybe. Maybe Mary gazed at the pictures of Jesus growing up, pictures of him playing with his cousin John, his brothers, his sisters, pictures of him working alongside Joseph as he learned his trade, pictures of Mary holding the baby Jesus, and pictures of Jesus as he gets older and bigger holding his mother Mary. I can't help but believe that for Mary, Mary wanted things to go back to normal too. Back to when her son was her son and she didn't have to share him with the world. Back when he was hers, when he was growing and learning and it didn't seem like he'd ever grow up into the promise spoken by the angel all those years ago. I can't help but believe that for Mary, she just wanted things to go back. Back to the way they had been. Back to the way they used to be. Back to normal. But things can't go back. They never go back. It's the cruelest trick of time. 
The hands on the watch, they don't go backwards. We can never go back. Matthew tells us of two other disciples, two other Marys, who find themselves on the way to Jesus' tomb in the early hours of the first day of the week, after the Sabbath, in the pre-dawn hours of the first workday of Sunday. Matthew simply says, they went to see the tomb. Notice, he doesn't mention anything about them bringing spices. It's just Mary Magdalene, and somebody Matthew says is the other Mary. Salome's not there, none of the others. They don't come to anoint Jesus' body. There's no conversation along the way. Who's going to roll away the stone? I don't know. It's not there. Mark tells us that, but Matthew doesn't. No, all Matthew says is they went to see the tomb. Now, a lot of scholars will say, and I think they're right, that Matthew does this to sort of emphasize this idea of seeing in his gospel, to be aware of what we're seeing, not with the eyes of the disciples, but what God chooses to reveal. But I'm convinced there's something more, more grounded in that statement. Yeah, I think Matthew's calling our attention to the things we should see, but I think that these two Marys are doing what so many of us do from time to time. Because every once in a while, maybe on your way home from work, the drive takes just a little bit longer. You take a short little detour. You turn on to the narrow drive. You park your car. Maybe there's a curb. And you walk through the field of stones. And you're looking for his name or her name. And maybe you stop and you kneel down and you brush away the grass clippings, pull up the weeds, and there it is. And you read the dates. Born, died. they are words like beloved father, loving mother, dearest friend. And you stop. You stop just to see it. You don't come thinking somebody's going to raise up out of the dirt. You don't come expecting to see an angel. You don't come for any other reason but to see the grave. To just be there. To visit where they buried the body of your wife, your husband, your mother, your child. You just stop to see it because every once in a while you need to feel like they're close by. Like you can still talk to them. Like they're sitting right there to tell you everything you need to hear just one more time. I think, I think that's why the two Marys simply went to see the tomb. To stand there and see it. To remember. They weren't expecting to see Jesus there alive again. Maybe they just wanted to see where they laid him one more time to remember how it used to be one more time to tell stories together one more time to reminisce just one more time the way it was when he was still here. Because it's those times, those times we wish the most that things could just go back to normal, back to the way they used to be when they were right here with us. But if Easter morning teaches us anything, it's that we can't really ever go back. That this life of faith is not a life lived looking in the rearview mirror, but the life of faith is a life lived in an ever forward fashion. But can I tell you something, though? Can I tell you something? The truth of Easter, the truth that we can't ever go back, that this life of faith has always lived forward in that moving direction. Can I tell you something? I don't like it. I suspect you don't either. It's troubling. It's troubling. It unsettles us. Especially in a day when so many of us really wish we could go back. When it could go backwards. Back to times colored by our selective memories in a rosy tint. It's troubling to think that the wheels of time only grind forward. That things won't ever go back to the way they once were. 
that we'll never have it like we once had it, that things change and that things will always change. It's troubling to us. It bothers us. It's so troubling to some folks that they'll do whatever they can to stem the momentum of history, to assuage the ever-advancing march of time. It bothers us. But why? Why is it so troubling to us? Why do we long so often to go back when the call of Christ and the inevitability of God's kingdom is always forward? Isn't it obvious? It's in the text. We long to go back for the same reason that the first words to the two Marys from both the angel and Jesus are the same. Do not be afraid. The truth of Easter, the ever onward call of the resurrected Christ, can be frightening. And yet Jesus says, do not be afraid. It's frightening because it's a call to trust a God that we cannot see, to take us to a place we've probably never been, surrounded by people that we don't know or worse yet, maybe don't like. The reality of Easter can be frightening as it calls us to outside of those places that we're familiar, outside of where we're comfortable in control, outside of places where we know the lay of the land and feel that we've got it all figured out. That's what Easter does. It says, you think you got it figured out, Jack? Nope, you don't. The ever onward call of Christ is frightening perhaps most of all because it requires our faith. It requires trust, trust in the one who calls us out into the unknown, into uncertainty, into a world that may not always have our best interests in mind, to people who may not like us or in fact hate us. It requires faith, faith to stare death in the face and say, I know that you're not the end. I know that you don't get the last say. And that's frightening. That's why those first words are Easter from Jesus. I do not be afraid. The truth of Easter, however, isn't only a source of uncertainty and fear. Because when you're not afraid of something, there's got to be more. No thanks be to God, the truth of Easter is a source of joy. After all, doesn't Matthew tell us that the women, when they heard the news from the angel about Christ's resurrection, that they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy. And they ran to tell the disciples. Fear and great joy. How how in the world can two seemingly contradicting emotions take place in the same heart at the same time? How can somebody possibly be filled with great joy and fear At the same time, how can somebody be filled with joy at all at the news that things won't be the same, that things will never go back to normal, that things won't return to the way they once were? How are you filled with joy in that? How? By faith. That's how. Yes, the women were overcome with fear at the news, the reality. And Jesus had been raised from the dead. And yes, some of that fear is grounded in the notion that things won't ever go back to the safe, predictable certainty of so-called normal. But there is joy to be found in this truth, that this same resurrected Christ, this same Savior who calls us ever on, this same God who raised Jesus out from the grave has done so with the promise that the best is still yet to come. The truth of Easter is that Christ calls us away from those things and calls us always forward because there is always more. Always more to show us, always more to give us, always more to which we are called. The truth of Easter is that really, really, if we really believe the man, if we really believe the the risen Christ, we don't ever want to go back. That's the truth. Because what God has in store for us is always, hear me, always better than anything that's behind us. The truth of Easter is that there's no going back to normal. Because God has called us to a higher way. A way above anything we may label as normal. 
The truth of Easter is that there's no going back to the so-called good old days because Christ is calling us to even better days, even beyond the reach of death. The truth of Easter is frightening to us because it calls us out of our places of comfort, out of our certainties, out from whatever tombs of complacency we have carved out for ourselves. Yet the truth of Easter is full of joy. For while it calls us out of our comfort, control, and certainty, it raises us to a new life of abundant joy and possibility through the raised Christ. The truth of Easter. The truth of Easter may lead through a tomb, but that's the joy, friends, is it leads through it and on into resurrection. The ever forward call of Christ does not end with death. And it does not end with this day. It's easy, I think, for us to say, it's Easter, put a period on the sentence, we're done. But it doesn't end with this day. It is an eternal call a call that we follow even through death on into resurrection. It is a call that fills us with great fear and great joy. It's a call that Christ has put forth to you today. So I wonder how you will answer. How will you answer the call that comes from the resurrected Christ? Will you seek to follow that ever forward call of the raised Jesus or Will you needlessly, selfishly cling to that false hope that maybe one day, maybe one day it'll all just go back. It'll all just go back to normal. I'll have it the way I want it. I'll have my control, my power. I'll have it all back to the way I remember it. But the truth of Easter, friends, is this. We can't go back. And thanks be to God and the truth of the gospel, we should never really want to. For Christ is calling us ever, ever on. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us, O God, when we seek to always go back when we live our lives looking over our shoulders, especially, especially in your presence, God, when we feel the keen call of discipleship, help us, Lord, to look ever forward to you as you go before us, Lord, to live in the truth of your call and to know that it does not end with this day. Lord, as we now come to this table to be served, may you speak to us as we worship through these elements of the bread and the cup. Bless them, O oh God. Speak to us through them. May we feel your Holy Spirit in this place, we pray in your holy name. Amen.